Welcome to the Surfcasters Journal Night Fishing Podcast. Our mission is to share our passion of surf fishing by bringing you interviews and conversations with some of the sport's most fascinating people. I am your host, Zeno Roman, co-founder of Surfcasters Journal Magazine at surfcastersjournal.com, book author, and of course, an avid surfcaster. It is my pleasure to introduce Al Gag Gargliaducci, one of my good friends, one of the legend in this field. He's been making laws for a long time. He's been part of some of the greatest blitzes of all time, and he has some good friends over the years, and we'll talk all about them. Uh, Al, uh, or Al Gags, as everybody knows him, welcome to the Night Shift Podcast. Thank you, Zeno. It's an honor to be here. I, uh, I, you know, I, when people told me that uh, you were actually doing a podcast with the Surfcasters Journal and everything, I was pretty excited. And then I get the call to do one. I was very excited. So, well, we, we should tell everyone, first of all, that we did this three days ago and we fucked it up completely. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing no, I well, we, we did press the record button, but we only got the one side of the recording. So we're redoing it. So if anyone finds anything weird about this podcast, this is probably why. Uh, but I just want to kind of got, let everybody know that we did kind of screw it up. Listen, now you are a wealth of information. You've been doing this for a long time. Give me a little bit of a backstory. And I know this is gone quite a bit of time, but like, how did you get involved in this lore building stuff? Well, Zeno, it was 1978. Uh, I had gotten married in 1974. And you know, when you get married, you take on a wife and and then we had a child not too long after that. And I got married young. I was 19 years old. And um, always had the love for fishing and always had a love, but didn't have much money. I think I was making $72 a week, believe it or not, at the time. Yeah, listen, I'm at the time. I'm sure that wasn't great money, but it, you know. And my rent was 144 a month. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> well, that's what everything included. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyways, um, I, I used to love to shad fish, Z, you know, so... I started making my own darts, my own shad jigs, you know, and I didn't have the money to go out and get paint and all this fancy stuff like they have today. So I used my wife's nail polish. And I didn't realize that I was actually doing something that was going to launch me into my future the way it did. So what happened was um, a good friend of mine, he was an outdoor writer. It still is at 80 something years old for the well, Springfield Union. Him. Yeah. And by the name of Frank Souza. And uh, gave me a call and he said, hey, let's go shad fishing. So, you know, in the spring, that the Connecticut River rips. I mean, it's just coming. So here we are in a 12-foot aluminum boat. Right? And we got a six-horsepower motor on it. We're not getting too far up the current. We're full blast, but we're getting there. We're making progress, you know. So we pull up to all the guys that are shad fishing. We put our anchor out and we anchored up. And... You know, you go by people, how you doing? And they're shaking their head. No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. So we put our anchor out. We start fishing and we start killing these fish. I mean, crushing them, you know. And to me, it was just another day shad fishing, you know. All of a sudden, uh, you know, we're, we're getting them, getting them. And guys are saying, what are you using? I said, a shad dart, you know. So Frank says to me, he goes, we need to come out tomorrow. I said, yeah, all right. You know, you have to twist my arm too much. I'll get out here with you, you know. So out we went, out we go, and uh, we get out there, and uh, he brings a fly rod with him, and he puts one of my darts on the end of the fly rod, and he just pays it out the back in the current and leaves it there. Well, that thing got hit, and it ripped every ounce of fly line off the dart, uh, off the reel, snapped it, and I said, wow, what the heck was that? He goes, I don't know. So the next day, the guys that trapped the salmon at the lift call him up because they tell him all the salmon. You know, he puts the count in the newspaper. For right, everybody. right. He was a columnist, right. They said, Frank, we got an interesting thing up here. We got a salmon with a dart hanging out of his mouth with about 50 feet of fly line. He goes, that's my fish. The guy goes, no, sir. He goes, I'm telling you, that's my fish. <laughs> so he goes up there. He took pictures of it and everything. And sure enough, they had it in the lift, in the trap. And uh, they got the uh, the dart out of them and everything because they release them and they get the eggs out of them, you know. So we go back out the next day and we got more shad. And at the end of the day, Frank looked at me and he said, listen, 
you got to market these things. You got something here. And I said, that's right, Frank, with all my millions, I'm going to run right out and market these things. And I had no intention of doing anything, nothing. You know, I was making my $72 a week and I was happy, you know. Well, I used to love to read his articles on Sunday morning. So Sunday morning came and I picked up the newspaper. And by the way, that circulation in our area was about 250,000 papers. At wow. The time. So <laughs> I pick it up and it says new lure to hit market soon. And I start reading about this new lure, you know, and it was me. He wrote about it. <laughs> my name he was pre-sold in. your shit already. Exactly. He put me in a pot of shit, to be honest with you. Um, you know, my name's in there, my phone number and everything. And my phone starts ringing, you know, my wife was going crazy at the time, waking the baby up and this and that. So, you know, the guy's a good friend of mine and I can't make him look like an idiot. So I start molding these things. I go to work all day and I mold all night and go to work. That got old real, real quick. Yeah, you know? I bet. Yeah. But I started doing it and I'm in a two room apartment doing this, you know? And I wasn't, I molded outside. I had enough brains to do that, but I painted all and tied all the calf tail, which we used to use. And, um, it just started to explode from there. And it went from a certain amount of darts to a lot of darts to a real lot of darts. And then I started, uh, I bought a centripetal caster and, uh, I started making them, you know, the bodies and stuff, casting them. And then one thing led to another and I started getting into, I made some nice bucktails. I used to sell a lot of uppermans on Long Island and, back in the day and uh it just went from there i went to i made a lot of different jigs and then i launched everything and, and so was was that your this pro, your progression from the dots to like a bucktails and molds and then later in the plastic and wood is, is that how it worked yes well it went to wood after uh it, it went to wood uh just before the mambo minnows was born and stuff i I started with the needlefish and that's a whole nother story in itself. Right. I mean, right. we'll get to that. Yes. Yeah. It's got a lot of history to it, but, um, it, it started, uh, like I said, with the lead and then progressively went into, um, uh, wood and then plastic and now soft plastics, you know? Yeah. For, for those of you who don't know, I mean, I'll, I'll was, even when I started fishing and I started fishing in case anyone was curious in the United States somewhere, in the late 80s, I mean, the mambo minnows and the floating rattling popper and Mr. Bunker and all the plastic lures, there were like almost, uh, you know, what you see today in the store, like the SP minnows and stuff, like I'll had this shit down way before any of these people did. It's just a modern version of his stuff. Uh, and he, he was also making a wood lures at the time, which I was a big fan of and still am to this day. And again, uh, I know I've mentioned this to you before, but I'm going to say it again. I always felt that you made a lure for every man, for a fisherman, not for a collector, not for some other use. Like you really made a high quality lures at a good price. Like, you know, that's how I always felt about your lure. You weren't going to be wowed with, uh, with some kind of a fancy paint job, but you were going to, you know what you got and you caught a lot of fish on them. Well, you know, Z, it, it's just... Um... You have a passion, you know, and the passion burns inside of you. And uh, I, when we came out with the needle fishing, it was so important. You know, Boone was the first people to ever yes. make a needle fish, you know. And then um, we had started and Donnie Musso had started, you know. And, uh, and uh, Donnie makes a, a great lure, a great, great lure. He's a good man, great man. He is, he, yeah, he's, yes. He's, yes. he's a vintage guy. He's one of the old timers. I love the Absolutely. guy. Absolutely. I have the most respect in the world for him. And um, when we made that lure, you know, I was always the guy that I wanted to see what made a lure tick or what made a fish tick and why they hit it. And a needlefish, as you know, is a do nothing lure. So it's got this falling effect, a very slow, horizontal falling effect. So I wanted to make a thin diameter that would still be strong enough. And to weight it correctly so it would fall at a, at a slower rate because the people that use them and know how to use a needlefish correctly, throw them out and they reel them in slow, real slow. And you want that thing just zigzagging along, just taking its time, you know. And um, so that's when we came out with them. Now painting them, when we first started, 
I used to call him the firework plug. That's what we remember. <laughs> you cast them and they explode in midair, right? They, they exploded in midair. I said to the guy, don't worry about it. They're hitting a the profile anyway. So, <laughs> but, but, but we didn't have the kind of things that, uh, you know, that they have today. We had stuff that would just kill you. You opened the can, you passed out. Right, you know, right, you, right, right. So we... Automotive uh, primers and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I had one guy... Uh, we had mixed up a batch one night and we were going to do it with a Torganol sealer on it. And the ladies' birds upstairs died from, oh. the, from the papers when they went up. No canaries, they found them dead oh, in the cage. Great. <laughs> so anyways, um, you know, as we, as we progressed in it, uh, we became uh, very educated on the paint schemes and, and things to do and, and, and how to do it, you know? And, uh, from that day on, you know, needlefish just took off, you know. But you got to remember, we didn't have the equipment back then that they have today. I mean, for a man to go in his garage and be able to duplicate plugs and this and that, and it's because of the Internet, you know. Yeah, but, literally today you can make the stuff out of plastic. You you can do the, the printing like one at a time, whatever you want it. So, yeah, the world has changed quite a bit since then. <laughs> Zeno, humbly, in my opinion, and only my opinion, if I was <laughs> – 25 or 30 years younger, uh -huh. I would just be a monster with, with lures out there right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, but, you know, God blessed me with what he blessed me with, and that's where I am, you know. Now, tell me, since we're talking about that needlefish, and I know it's a very important part, and I, I we don't know who is the guy that threw wire first and for whatever it was, it was all around the same time. But tell me the significance of that lure, especially in the Block Island, like, like from your point of view. From my point of view, the needlefish in the New England waters was made and, and really got popularized in Block Island. Okay. And um, we used to try to put coat hangers through them back in the day. You know, we didn't have this aircraft aluminum wire they have now, you know. And uh, finally, I got my hands on some and we threw wired it. But Block Island was just a very sacred, special place. And uh, if you wanted big fish and you wanted to do it with needlefish, especially in the fall, that was the place to be, you know? And, but, but this is also the time of the almost like a collapsing stock where there was a very little fish and everywhere else, and there was a lot of fish in block, uh, unlike most places. And the other part of the story is that you are one of the few people that actually got on that sacred uh, Halloween blitz of, uh, what was the 1984 or somewhere well, Thanksgiving, the snow blitz. No, the snow about. blitz of, right, right. Oh, so yeah. I, I, wanna, I, I gotta hear the story because I, you know what? I've heard the story of Dennis's book and that's fine, but that's Dennis's point of view. I want to hear your story because obviously every person that was on that island has their own view of it, of the event. So how did it actually happen? Well, what happened to me, I never would have been on the island if it wasn't for Fred Arbogast. Now, he had called me, and, and again, we're back in the 80s, you know. Yeah, he's a sudden fellow, right? Yeah, he called me Yankee boy, you know. All the time. <laughs> he calls me up, and he says, hey, I want to come on up and catch some of them rockfish, because I've been telling them all September, October, you know, when we could catch them real right. good. You think he'd come up then? No, he waits till Thanksgiving. You know, and I'm like, I said, well, come on up. I said, we'll, we'll give it a try. And I was nervous, nervous as hell. Cause I said, you know what, this guy's going to travel all the way up here and, you know, I'm going to get him out on block and we're going to do our best and see what happens. Not knowing that we were going to be out there and this was going to happen to us, you know? And, um, so anyways, he flew into Hartford, Connecticut and he got off the plane. He was pale white. I guess the guy didn't like to fly. And I said, um, I didn't have the heart to tell him that we were driving to Westerly Airport, getting on one of them little planes with two Western House fans to take <laughs> off. <you know? laughs> a little shaky thing, right? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, you're only man. in the air nine minutes, Z, and then you're down, you know? So we get to Westerly, he says, where are we going? And he starts walking towards this Learjet that's on the regular. No, we're not in that thing. I said, we're over here, right? <laughs> he looked at the pilot. Well, the pilot ran the gas station back in town. Right? Oh, man. Oh, yeah. It like was like Mayberry, like, man. Run the, mean, the grocery store, too. Yeah. And, you know, we used to call him Akak -Ak Maroon, you know what I mean? So he had the bombardier hat on and everything. But, you know, he, he acted out a lot where he tried to just be funny with people. But as soon as we lifted off, the fog hit. Bang. 
We had nine minutes in fog. I mean, dense fog. We couldn't see anything. And I look at him and he winks at me and he like he was going to have fun with Fred in the back seat. And he says, uh, I don't know if I can land this thing. And I heard a little voice go, you better, boy. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyways, we get over the Black Island and he lays the vector right on the runway. And our wheels were four feet off the runway before we could see the tar. Imagine that. We couldn't see anything. So we land. We get to the airport. And my good friend, Andy Lamar, God rest his soul, he passed away too. Great, great fisherman. He picked us up at the, at the airport to bring us to the National Hotel that was over there. Now, it sounds glamorous, but it wasn't. None of it. No, of it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had a feeling that was coming too. Well, when you walked in the place, the guy says, you know, you're going to have to make your own beds. I said, that's okay. So he hands me a hammer and a saw. You know, I mean, that wasn't too encouraging. You know? <laughs> so anyways, we get in there. Andy brings us to the airport and man, it started to, I mean, brings us to the hotel and it started to snow. <laughs> and Fred says to me, what the hell is this? I said, it's called snow. I don't know if you see it down there where you're from. I said, he goes, man, he goes, it's freezing in here. Right. So a bunch of the guys that were there chipped in a sweater here, a jacket here, this, that, but we got them warmed up, straightened out. So we went down to Ballard's, me and him. A lot of the guys were at the sewer pipe or, you know, s somewhere else around the island, you know, and uh, I think so, Ballas is fairly easy fishing comparable to some of the places over there, right? Well, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that's a what lot I thought, of it. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I put him, you know, he was a big man, you know, he wasn't used to rock hopping or nothing. So I brought him right down onto the beach. I wanted it comfortable as I can. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. So I gave him a flow green needle fish. I had a flow green needle fish and he goes, what do we do? I said, throw it out and fall asleep reeling it in. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I'll show you. I took three cranks on the reel. I didn't think we were going to get bit, you know, whack. I got tight. So I hit the hand him the rod, right? And he goes, no, no, I'll catch my own. I goes, no, take this. I said, really, my arm's hurt and I can't get it. I said, I don't want to lose this thing. Fight this thing reeling in because I didn't know if we were going to get bit again. Right. I took his rod out of his hand. And I start to bring it in away from his fish. Whack. That thing got tight. He looks at me. He goes, I thought your arm was messed up. I goes, it's better now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, as the story goes, the average was 1,500 pounds of fish per man per night was done on that island. And uh, it, we didn't even know we were making history. Right, right. You don't know what other guys are doing on the other side. You thought you were the right. luckiest bastards in the face of the sun. Exactly. I thought I was in, in nonstop. Now, you know, uh, let's see. A bunch of guys broke 64 times over there. 6-0. That's correct. 6-0. We broke 53 times. And all the 40s and 30s you wanted, you know. And this thing, it must have been a massive school, a big, I mean, a massive fish, you know that I wish I could have seen, but nothing showed during the day. Nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. So he thought it was like this out there all the time. And I, you know, we went back to the hotel. Our arms were dragging, you know, we couldn't even pick them up. And uh, I said, listen, we got to get some sleep because we're going to be starting the tide at about 1130 tonight. I said, we're probably going to go into the daylight in, in the morning, you know. Yeah, yeah, no problem. He goes, it's easy out there. What do you think? He goes, this is nothing, right? I goes, oh, boy, he's in for a long night tomorrow night, right? So we went to bed, you know, we got up, we ate, and uh, hung around the hotel. A couple guys came in that were there, and, uh, you know, we got talking. How'd you do? They said, we absolutely murdered them last night. We said, we got to sell these fish. We were loaded over here. So they brought them to the co-op, you know, and we never, if it was today, I never would have kept a fish at all. Nothing. Knowing what I know, you know, but nobody knew any better back then, you know? So all of a sudden we get back out there that night, first cast for both of us, boom, it like somebody flipped a switch, a mirror of the night before it started up again. Well, anyways, we all got together and met. We went over to this place called Needlefish Rock and we laid our needlefish on the rock to let the tide take it out, knowing that this would never, ever ever happen again like that to us you know or it, it could have it could have happened to a lot of different guys and we just don't know about it but this was history this was something that was just amazing you know and uh 
and I never heard or seen anything like it even close to it again. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've been in some blitzes on Nosset and stuff with our, our good friend, Mr. Stetsko, but um, nothing like this. Yeah, nothing that like was one of those historical runs. I mean, everybody that was there, it says that they've never experienced anything like it, at least with size of the fish. And again, you guys had a benefit because the bl- the store snowstorm, I assume, cut out the uh, ferries and everything else, right? So there was no one coming. No, I mean, well, first of all, we the age of the cell phone wasn't there. Right. Obviously. So you, I had the pay phone at the National Hotel. By the time the operator got into the mainland, right, it would have been next Tuesday, you know? And I think at that point, by the time the word got back to, like, the island where Stevie Campo was at the time and stuff, right. it was too late. It was, it was too late. I don't, you know, them guys couldn't have made it out, you know? What was it about a dozen, two dozen guys on the island at most? Twelve, I think it was. Uh, Twelve. You know, I you think... mentioned you mentioned uh, Tony Setsko, who was uh, uh, again one of your uh, good friends and who's an another exceptional fisherman. And you had the benefit of of meeting some really really classy and 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 awesome people over the years, including Stan Gibbs and Bob Bond and all of them. Oh yeah, but, those guys they took me under their wing, and I'll but, never t- forget that. And I was the young guy. Still wish I was the young guy, but I'm not anymore. Yeah, you know? don't we all out. Uh, listen, I, I think, you know, look, I, I know we're getting up there, all of us, but I think you had a pretty freaking good life. Like, I you did. Have, I you did. have I made a complain. good contribution to a lot of people. You have made a lot of people laugh. Everybody loves you, and you're one of the most beloved people in this sport because you have never had a bad word for anyone, regardless if, if, if it was warranted. So I, I got I to gotta say you had a pretty damn good life. Well, you know, Z, people tell me right now, you know, they say, oh, why don't you retire and fish? And I, my answer to them is I already fished. I did it when I could do it. And um, I still do it now. Don't get me wrong. You know, I, I love the freshwater fish. I'm in a retiree league and stuff. And uh, and that was a whole nother side of my life when we made the Brian Kershaw Memorial whistle for the family when he passed away, when he was killed in a plane crash. Um. But it was just, I, I've been blessed. I've been truly blessed, you know. So now as a freshwater guy, you basically do the early bird thing. Like you, you get in, you get, <laughs> you get 12 o'clock out, and then you guys run for the early bird dinner? Well, no, we go, for, no, no, no. We, first, we get discounts on the ice cream cones. Oh. So we have to go for those things, right? How old do but I got to be to get that? You know, so far I've been blessed because all the guys are talking about sugar diabetes, who had this, who had that, right? And I don't have to, I don't talk about anything, though. No. I find that uh, if someone does anything that they enjoy, that's life well spent. And and again, I wanted to, before I forget, I want to talk about Tony Setsko a little bit. And there's, only, there's one reason for this, because Tony's obviously left us, uh, uh, unfortunately. And there's not a lot of people that can share just how the great uh, guy he was and a fisherman. And I wish in some ways maybe we should do a podcast with a bunch of other people who could maybe reflect on his memory because he was on, you know, we just did the interview with Steve Campo and, and I, I thought that Steve Campo was extraordinary in, in the way he taught about everything and his contributions to the sport. But, you know, there's other people like Alberto, like uh, Tony, like uh, um, uh, the guy that passed away that's escaping me was, was with uh, you at uh, Black Island, who was a fisherman, Tim Coleman was another guy who was exceptional. You know, there's a lot of these guys, Charlie Shaw, Cinto, uh, and Tony was a really an extraordinary human being and a fisherman. Tell me what made Tony a super exceptional surfcaster, not just a, a human. Well, Tony, when you talk about someone that lives, breathes, drinks, and eats a sport, there's very few people that can carry that moniker. And Tony Stetsko, like Alberto Nee, like Roy Libia, you know, those guys carry that moniker. You know, you'll get a guy sitting home or even listening to the podcast that say, oh, I love it. That's all I want to do. But when Tony used to talk about striped bass, he literally shake because it would get him going. And not only was he like that, but his father was like that. It was in their blood, you know, it was in their blood. And Tony would go up and down the beaches. I mean, he could smell the fish and he knew where they were. He knew what was going to happen before it happened. He had a very uncanny, 
uncanny way about him, you know. And a uh, funny guy, and I'll get into a couple of funny stories about him. Have you rolling? But he, um, just to watch him prepare, you know. I mean, he never took care of his equipment. You know what I mean? He get out there, you know, the lines twisted, this and that. He goes, oh, it'll, it'll straighten out. Ping, yeah, lead, lead us from last night. Yeah, no, it's we're good. <laughs> right, just exactly. run a little hand on it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Listen, we never had the equipment they have today. You know, Tony would wrap a few rods in the guides, right? There'd be file marks inside the guides, you know. <laughs> Here, try this out. This will work good for you all night, you know. I mean, the line looks like confetti when it comes out of here. You know? <laughs> but anyways, he um, he brought me up and down that beach. And at the time, you could go 25 miles out on Nauset Beach before the bad storm, before it got cut in half, you know. Tony had a shack out there from World War One or Two. I forgot which one it was, but they're leased to you and you keep them for, your, uh, for 99 years in a day. Okay. And then they can be handed to your family, you know, and he had that place out there and it was right near Pochett Island. We used to go out and people used to say, be remarkable. He'd say, come on, take a ride with me. I got to check the beaches here at low tide. Now keep in mind, this guy lives here and he's on the beach every single day, every day. So out we go. He'd bring me to all the transition points where sand came to gravel about, you know, um, anything. And, you know, and he teach me to look up into the dunes, visualize what I'm looking at up there, how it's tapering down. It's going to be the same way out there, but only for this season. He says, don't get sold on this one spot. Cause that's why you got to drive it every day after a bad storm. You may have to start all over again. So we'd go out and we, we look at these beaches up and down all over the place. And we start marking areas like with a fluorescent thumbtack, put it in a piece of wood, you know? And if the fog came, he'd drive closer to the dune so we could pick up that thumbtack. You know, it was, and then your odometer, we used to use that to line up on spots at night. 25 miles is a long way. Z. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you're going 10 miles an hour. Oh God. Yeah. You know, so, and we go from one end to the other all night and all morning long fishing, you know? But this man was just incredible. And when he didn't feel like fishing anymore, he would get out of his Jeep, pull his easel out of the back of the Jeep, put a stool out there, sit down and tell me to go stand near the water and make a painting out of me. And it would look really good. I never thought I looked like, I, you know, I look like a stick man. coming. Out of this <laughs> thing. But, you know, still, I mean, he, he could see deeply into things, you know, and, but he was a character. Tony was a character, probably him and Sharapo, probably the two greatest men to ever chase stripers, I think, in the world today, um, from what they know. And those two used to argue like crazy. You know, we, we were out on the, we went to go out to Monomoy one night and we go out there with, with motorboats, you know. And I'd be in a boat, say, with Mike DeSimone or somebody, you know, and we get out there first and it'd be foggy. You start listening. And I said, Mike, here they come, right? And you could hear them. And they're yelling at each other, you idiot, you asshole, this and that, right? And they're going, Wah. and they crash onto the beach. And Sharapo go flying out of the boat. Then they start fish fighting. We had to go break them up, you know what I mean? But they were good buddies, you know what I mean? It was crazy, the stuff we went through, you know? But uh, a good example was we had them down in Hartford one time. And to get Tony to leave Cape Cod, and you had to dangle a carrot and it wasn't money. I found out what it was. It was food, you know? So Emma Lagasse was doing, when he was younger, was doing a big show at the Hartford Civic Center the same time we were doing our show, the, 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 the fishing show. So the promoter said to me, I'm getting him a ticket, but I'm going to get you a ticket. You're going to sit right in front of Emerald, right we know where he cooks and he hands you the food. We had those two seats, right? He said, and Tony said, I'm there. Well, he couldn't wait. So my, the promoter says to me, keep an eye on him, you know, cause he gets nuts, you know, he doesn't understand. So we're sitting there and Emerald's cooking and Emerald hands him stuff. And he, now there's a microphone right there. You know, people can hear it. It's 300 people in the stadium, you know, and you can hear a pin drop. 
Emerald says to her, here you go. He goes, and your name again? He goes, uh, Anton, just call me Tony. He goes, everybody calls me Tony. He says, okay, here you go, Tony, try this. And so Stetsko eats it, and he goes, oh, my God, this is good. He goes, what's in it? And Emerald told him, he goes, oh, no shit, right? And he goes, <laughs> and it goes, it goes over to Mike, and you hear people like snickering in the back. And Emerald looks at him, gives him kind of a smile, and he cooks up something else, and he gives it to Tony. And Tony's flabbergasted over this recipe now. And Emerald tells him what to do. And Emerald's got him standing up next to him. And Tony goes, "No effing way, right? Come on, right?" And and the the promoter looks at me from across the thing, and he's going like this, you know, giving I me the cut you, outside, I told you, you know? to keep him in line. Get him out of there. Get him out, right? So we had to wheel him out. But the best one was when portable mics first came out, they had him mic'd up in Hartford to do a seminar. There was a little kid in the front row. You know how they get rambunctious and stuff. Stetsko gets very intense when he's at, when he's speaking, and he's telling you, what to do with these fish on a moon tide, this tide, that tide. And this kid starts throwing stuff and rolling around in the front of him. <laughs> All this stuff, right? So finally, I'm in there and the seminar was over and we're, everybody's walking out. So we, they finally walk out. Stetsko gets out in the hall with me, right? And we're walking towards the booth to go back in the hall. And they won't let it, they wouldn't let anybody near him until he got back to his booth. So we're going down the hall. I said, Tone, what did did you know that family with the kid? He said, That little bastard, are you kidding me? Right. But he was still mic'd up and it was going over the speakers inside the seminar room. Oh, that's great. <laughs> everybody's sitting there and he's blasting his kid and i says oh my god i had to shut the switch off you know what i mean it was funny you know but it, you know the guy was just unique in a lot of ways and his father could sit there and whittle the plug with a jackknife right in front of you take a piece of driftwood and turn it into a fishing lure he definitely was uh, an interesting not a character but also uh, uh, one of the fishermen who seemed to have a different not a, not a different, I would call that almost an extraordinary way of being able to find the fish before anyone else. I had different understanding of the fisheries, and, and maybe it's because they put so much time. I fish with, with Crazy Alberta, what they call him, and I've, I've seen the same thing that he does. And like, uh, I think you and I have discussed this before when Alberta went to Florida. Everybody says, ah, you can't, you know, you can't do that kind of stuff. And next thing you know, he's doing stuff from the jetties that no one has ever done from the boat. So for whatever reason, these people tend to have something special about them. Alberto is a different animal. Alberto is truly, truly a legend. And he, he turned Florida into stuff that Florida never knew they had. He'd get out there at night. There was nobody doing the stuff Alberto does at night. I I agree. Nobody. I agree. Nobody. And he's getting, I mean, monster snook. He had me make him special jigs that would hold these giant snook. And I said, Alberto, I says, uh, how big are these snook? And he's telling me, I didn't doubt him. I just said, wow, those are awful big. And then out the pictures come, you know? And I said, wow, not only that, them giant reds he does and stuff, you know, and these people drive by these beaches unsuspecting every day and know that the night before Alberto knee is sitting there doing what he's got to do. You know what I mean? What was your inspiration to to make lures like even today? Like, all right, let, let's get to today. Like, so now you went from your lure uh, business, which you sold uh, uh, in, at some point, and your plastic business, and now you're doing basically a rubber. Like, okay, what made you think to say, all right, now I'm going to do rubber? Like, our gags, the rubber, the the eel. What's the name of the eel? The whippet eel. The whippet eel, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a huge thing. It's obviously very popular in the Cape and everywhere else. You sell a lot of that shit. Like I see in boxes and boxes and boxes going stuff. Like, what made you decide that you now, after you sold your wood business and your plastic business, you wanted to do a rubber? Like, well, I always thought, you know, Zeno, in making lures, people don't understand there's water dynamics involved. You know, and I wanted to make something that was extraordinary, something that would roll like a wooden plug in water. That's why, you know, plastic is plastic, but wood is natural. So I wanted to take a soft rubber, uh, com- you know, component and try to put it into a lure that actually would do what a plug would do. 
and I had to design a head for it first. And so when I designed that head, so that head would swim and oscillate, when you put the eel behind it horizontally, the way the head's designed, the water goes up the side of it, you know, and then flows under the tail and just makes it just go along just beautiful, you know. And uh, and just like any other eel, you know, you do it off the beach and you want that thing puffing in the sand, just banging like that, you know, as you're bringing it in. But when I did the whippet fish, I wanted to use the same head. And that was to cut the paddle tail at different degrees until I got it to where it matched up and swam good. Because, you know, Gary Yamamoto made the Cinco and he turned people out there that couldn't catch a bass into a great fisherman. Seriously. That's true. That's true. And that gave me a lot of inspiration to make the whippet fish the way I did, because I said, you know, when people, you know, if, if I see someone out there fishing and they're struggling or they clearly it's apparent, they don't know what's going on or what they're doing. I walk over and try to help them. And I'll say, here, try this, do this, or try this and that. And all of a sudden they get bit or they catch a fish. Well, you just hook that guy into the sport. And so, believe me, like that pencil you got in your hand, you put 12 of them together, you can't break it. But individually, we can be broken. And there's an organization, I'll get into it a little while into the podcast, that's trying to break us. And that's that's my whole focus now in this industry is to protect what we have right now. And uh, you're, you're a big fan of PETA, right? That's, that's No, PETA. I am not a big fan of PETA. <laughs> Don't start. I am not. And these are the people that pick at your house. Oh, they did. They came. It was crazy. You know, my neighbor calls me up and says, have you looked out your front window lately? I said, no, why? He says, well, take a look out there. And I looked out there and there's people carrying signs, weapons of mass destruction made here, fish killer, this, that. I'm like, are you kidding me? Right. But they didn't realize the chief of police lived next to me. So he sent about four cruisers over there and, they had no permits, no this, their cars got told. It wasn't a nice day for them at all, you know, but I had no bad words with them. I didn't, I didn't provoke anything, but they're looking to take everything away from us any way they can. You know, I went to Boston to fight one night with Bob Pond and it was like 40 of them against us. They wanted us to manufacture lures with barbless hooks, but they didn't even understand what a barb was and how it operated and what it did. And once we explained it, it wasn't really a, it was a magistrate that was hearing the case and he ended up throwing it out. But if we didn't show up, that would have passed. You have to show with the opposition, you know, and in today's day and age, the younger guys, they really got to take a hard look at everything out there because don't pass the buck to the next guy because that next guy may not be there. You know, somebody's got to take initiative and do it, you know. And yeah, we're definitely losing not only the access to the places because everybody's guarding as as they invented the freaking earth. And if you buy a house on a beach, all of a sudden you don't want anybody in front of it. But we're also losing the ability to, you know, harvest the fish, to fish, to to teach the younger generation, which we pass on to them. You know, this whole sport is getting shrunk. You know, video games, the kids are not as involved in the outdoors. All of that is contributing to to less participation. And, and yet, for me personally, who's fished with his grandfather since I was born, I mean, there's nothing more enriching in my life that has been than, than being part of the outdoors. Exactly. Exactly. You know, <clears throat> I always close my shows, my seminars, my TV shows, everything with the same thing. You know, it's the only outdoors we have, so let's protect it, you know. And that saying means a lot. It, it it really does. And people don't understand that comes from deep within inside. You know, I've seen so much and, and heard so much and it was involved with all these scams and people to, to try to take our sport away and to see how the politics worked behind the scenes. And it was just sickening, just sickening, you know, and I'll, I'll go head to head with anybody that's going to try to take it away. You know, I will still do that. I think that most of us or all of us should definitely applaud you and everybody else like Bob Pond and a lot of people like Fred Schwab, like Charles Whittaker, a lot of people that get involved behind the scenes and go into those those meetings and do whatever needs to be done. But I also think people should understand when you ask to do something as simple 
a sign a petition, just do it. Like, don't expect someone else to do it for you because you might be sorry the next day. Right. I mean, look at, we just lost a great man and you know who I'm talking about, Fred Galifaro. Yes, absolutely. Lost that man week. was yes, just terrible. a prince and, yes. it was, and he just, he just, he died way too young, I think. I think I know he was, you know. I personally don't know anyone like Fred. You know, there's exceptional people in your life in different ways. You are one of them. You are like one of the one of my dearest friends, one of the nicest people that I ever met. You always have a smile and something nice to say for everyone. Where you almost ask, are you for real? Fred Galafari was the same way. You know, he gave me the start in fishing. He published my first article. He always encouraged me to write. He was super excited about the Surfcasters Journal. He helped us at the shows. Like, he could have said, no, you can't come to the Fisherman Show. You guys are competing with us. He'd be like, no, come over. There's room for everyone. Like, you almost asked him, are you for freaking real? Like, yeah. are you a real <laughs> I mean, he was that nice. And he was, it was so influential in so many decisions, in so many fights, in so much work that he put behind the scenes that uh, he's really going to be missed. And I hope that the generation, next generation, gets some kind of an idea through something that we can do to remember him as a great man that he was. You well, know what I'm saying? I, you know, Zeno, he he was the type of guy, I mean, you probably talked to him on many an occasion, and he had that voice with, uh, oh, you really think so, Zeno? Yes, 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 huh? yes. He was always surprised, yes, and quiet. Yeah. Well, yeah, you could put that on the table. I, I think that'd be all right. Sure. You know, never got excited. Never, nah. nothing like that, you know? And um, every time he see me, he smile, he come over, he, he'd shake my hand, give me a big hug. And I said, where's my table? He goes, wherever you want it. Right. And I said, come on, just tell, him, tell me where I'm going, you know? But a man like Fred, you know, I hope some of the younger guys out there got to enjoy Fred or got to really understand who he was. And I will say it again. You got people like yourself doing what you're doing. And they say, oh, Zeno's the guy with the Surfcasters Journal, and he does a podcast. But they don't realize what you did to get there. They don't realize who you helped. They don't realize what you've seen or learned or felt or anything, you know, the same way with Alberto, you know, Roy Levia, all these guys. These guys are alive, man. Go to them, talk to them, enjoy them while they're here, because pretty soon, you know, the Lord calls you and you're gone. And, and, no, I and agree with you. I mean, you know, one of my biggest regrets, and it's not regret in the terms that I can uh, 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 point the finger. Well, Fred and I weren't the best friends that we talked to, but I wish I could just talk just like I do with my dad who left at 60 and my grandfather. Like one conversation would mean a world to me. So when right. you get, get a choice to, 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 to at the shows to talk to Alberto, to talk to Roy, to talk to any of these guys who know their shit, who you respect, and even the older guys, they don't need to be a damn celebrities. You know, guys like that you see on a beach, like even like, okay, obviously Donnie Musa is a celebrity, but there's so many guys that Donnie Musa fishes with that are just as good as fishermen that he is in his generation, and they're not celebrity. You know, enjoy the 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 company. You know, pick their brains. But you see, you're right. You see, Z, the problem is, and I see it a lot on Facebook and everything. Everybody's arguing who's the best, who's this. What they don't understand, there's only one pro out there, and that's Mother Nature. She's out there all the time, and you're not going to beat her. She oh, will she win kicks every my ass all the time. time. Oh, exactly. Oh, she does. Exactly. But guys like Alberto and Roy. You know, that, that are out there 24 7, 24 7, okay? They, you know, those are the guys that are very approachable. Don't be afraid to go up and talk to them. And, you know, don't go up to them and say, hey, oh, where's your best fishing spot? You, you may not get that, but you'll get the right rod, the right You're lure, definitely the right not going to get that. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you know, but you'll get a lot. You'll, you'll get a lot, a real lot. You know? I, think, and, I think this is why people enjoy their seminars because they do get a lot out of it. Going back to your lures, all right, let's talk about your lures for a second because obviously you're making a lot and you're making a lot of it in a different... What is the hardest part of, of doing what you do? Because, you know, it's not only that you have to design, you have to, 
you have to produce the laws, but you also have to get the materials and you got to get the right materials. You can't just buy rubber and melt it and make it and colors and hook sizes and all the shit that goes on and shipping and uh, customers. So, so I'm exhausted just thinking about it. <laughs> well, Z, I, I can tell you one thing. Uh, there's a lot of luck involved. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm a genius. In my opinion, I'm not. Okay. But what I do is like my passion will come out. Sometimes I'll wake up at two in the morning with an idea and I get up and I run down and I draw the lure out on paper. So I don't forget it that morning. Then I have a hard time going back to sleep. But anyways, when the morning comes, I start, start and I try to bring it to life. And what you do is you have to become part of it. You have to become I hate to say this, but you got to try to feel into it or feel like it, you know, and then um, the, the dynamics and the design that goes behind it has to, everything has to drive the way it hits the water, the way you want it to move, the materials. If you understand the materials that you can make prototypes with, it's going to help you a lot. You know, you have to understand what you're working with and the dynamics of what you're working with and how it works and what you want it to do. Now, you may build something. Let's say I'll just throw this crazy thing out. You may build something on a styrofoam and you love the way it does a certain thing. But can you get it to do the same thing out of 50 percent high grade or 50 percent low grade plastics or whatever? That's what you got to understand is how to blend it to make it work. You know what I mean? And when you did it enough on certain items, it sort of gives you a little bit of a head start, you know, but I start with clay, hard clay, and I'll mold everything and look at it. And then I'll take like, uh, I used to love my dentist when he was in practice, my, my oral surgeon, because I get all the scaffolds from him and everything. And I cut everything out, you know, let the clay get hard and then really shave it into what I want, you know? And, um, but that's the, that's the, uh, the advantage of me being in the building I'm in. My building is full of artists, full of design people. We have people below me that make all the animation things for Disney. So I have some very smart people here that share their knowledge, you know. And um, I just enjoy, when you enjoy what you do, your passion will flow. Your passion will come out. And uh, I'd rather sit and design lures all day than hit the beach. I'll be honest with you. Well, when I when I get up at 2 a.m. is usually to pee. That's the only thing I get up <laughs> at 2 a.m. Just so we you know, I'm getting at the age when I'm getting up more than once a night. Uh, but another thing for a guy that made a lot of laws and spent basically his whole life in a fishing, one way or another, designing, fishing, and all that, doing the shows. What is your recommendation to someone who's starting today as far as colors, because not only you, you painted every color known to a man and you fished it. What's our gag's view on colors? Personal view. Now, I, l listen, l let's just let's just make this clear, guys. Buy all the colors, please. Don't don't the, <laughs> don't not buy some of the Alice color. Buy all of them. I'm just saying, listen, I know you have your own uh, view. So so let, let me hear it. Well, as Fred Galafaro would say, uh -huh. you got to have the colors. <laughs> you need the colors right <laughs> no but he anyway. would say that probably right. in a monotone voice <laughs> right or either that you got to snap bucktails with john right you know? <laughs> but anyway and there's another good fisherman too you know but um as far as colors concerned there's only really two colors in the whole spectrum we make 38 colors basically to confuse everybody you know you know but um you got dark or light you know and uh, white or black, you know, basically you keep it really cut and dry and simple. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, you always have a mare of the beach, so to speak. I'm at Island Beach State Park in Jersey one time. I'm driving down the beach. Everybody's rods bent. Everybody, right? So it was an overcast day. I get out. I got a black and, and purple eel on, you know. And I'm walking down towards the water and the mayor comes up to me, goes, oh, ho, ho. he said, if that ain't yellow, they ain't hitting it. Right. I said, really? He goes, yeah. I said, well, let me take a shot and see. Anyways, I throw it out there. I got tight right away. He goes, they shouldn't have hit that. I goes, what do you think? They, they looked at it and said, oh, grape. I never tasted that before. Let me bite it. Right. I says, no, it's what the, the water column, the, the light penetration, everything allows them to see the best on that day. You know, 
Tony was a good guy for this, a great guy. It was black at night, white during the day, right? And if some got overcast or hazy, maybe throw an olive once in a while or a yellow, but that was it. He never, we never complicated it. We never complicated it. You know, now you're fishing next to a guy. And this is what I mean about instant gratification out of some of the fishermen today. You get down to the, to the canal. Somebody throws a pink whippet fish or a pink savage or something out there. Right. And they get tight. The guys next to them don't even bother. If they ain't got it in their bag, they, they run over to one of the stores down here, you know, and they buy them all out and come back. By the time they get back, they're on blue now. Right? You know? <laughs> the bite is either over or the fish moved on. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of truth to that. But uh, listen, it, the world has changed to to a large extent, and I'm so glad that your laws are so popular in the canal and everywhere else. In closing, tell me what is the best part of what you do. What what what, what gives you the most joy? What gives me the most joy is talking to the people, putting smile on people's faces, knowing that I have contributed to someone's happiness somewhere along the line. You know, and. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story, man. You know, to all you fishermen out there, again, if you see somebody in trouble or somebody not as fortunate as you and it's pretty blatant, do something to make their day better. Do something to make them happy. What I did, I see there was a little kid on the beach and we had a blitz going on and he had a beer can and a string, you know, and he's out there twirling it, throwing it in the surf. Now, I'm going back now, early 80s, and uh, he's trying to get out there. So I looked down and I handed him my rod. I said, here, I cast it out for him. And he's starting to reel it. And he, he hooked a few fish and he had a ball. And at the end of the day, at the end of the session, I said, this rod is for you. You take it home. You know, and I gave him a, a couple of lures and the look on that kid's face, I'll never forget. So about five to six, seven, maybe 10 years ago, I'm at the Providence show. A man walks in my booth very well dressed, him and his wife and a little boy. And they're looking around and he's smiling, like shaking his head, you know, looking around going, yep, yep. You know, and his wife's staring at me and I'm saying, all right, what did I do? So I'm happy here, right? You know? And uh, finally he looked at me and he goes, you don't remember me, do you? And I says, uh, well, to be honest with you, sir, I meet a lot of people. I says, and uh, no, I don't. I said, I'll be honest with you. He goes, you ever fish fire district beach in Rhode Island? I goes, yeah. He goes, do you remember being down there in a big blitz? I said, well, I was down there in a few of them. I said, uh, anything happened in particular? He goes, you remember a little kid you gave a fishing rod to? And right when he said that, I got chills. He said, I'm that kid, you know? And he now he's an orthopedic doctor, a surgeon, you know? And his wife said, your rod is hanging over our fireplace. He said, he'll never get rid of that. And that brought me the best joy ever out of anything. It's the things that you do to people. And I don't expect anything back. I never expected this guy to come and, you know, find me uh, 40 years later or whatever it was. I, you know, and I'm like, wow, you know, but the best thing out of this whole business is the joy. When people come up to you at a show and said, Hey, my son or my grandson got his first schoolie or something on that lure. Well, he's standing there and he's so, so smiling, so proud. I'll go get a pack of them say, here you go. Go get me another one. But I need a picture this time so I can put you on that banner over there, right? Take this away. I give half of my store away at a show. I don't care, you know? I mean, to me, it's just, it's all about the kids. It's all about trying to maintain the sport, basically. I agree with you 100%. I know personally, uh, as somebody who's written book and stuff, that to me, the most joy that i've ever got out of this whole business and surfcasters journal and hoodies and podcast is when somebody comes to you and said you know either a you help me understand this law or you help me understand the white water or because of you i've done this and i had such a great night i mean oh i caught my first striper after all i mean like what can be better than that i mean thousands of my stripers could not equate to one of his his right. first striper is more important than a hundred, hundred fish days in a row for me. Oh yeah. It, you know, it, and it's not about the numbers. Z. What it is is what you just said, whitewater, how to fish it, what to do. And you'll get the guy, the average guy listening, you know, and you know, once you think you know it all, that's when you're going to go downhill quick. 
you know. Today, I love to learn and I love to listen. Like if Alberto speaking or you're speaking or Roy speaking, I'm going to listen. I'm going to get something out of it. You know what That's I mean? That's why everybody loves you. And listen, I want to thank you again for spending tonight again an hour with me after the <laughs> <after laughs> failed podcast on Sunday. <laughs> so if somebody minds, listen, this is our number two, and I think we did a hell of a job, Al. Well, hey, you know what, Z? Uh, you lead by example, and you're a good leader in this community, and, and I thank you for having me on, and I'm humbled. And to you listeners out there, always remember, it's the only outdoors we have, so please let's protect it. Zeno, thank you, and good night. And that's that. I couldn't say any more than that. We are grateful that you took time from your busy day to listen to the Surfcasters Journal Night Shift Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, we would love if you would share it with your fishing buddies and leave a rating and review to whatever app you use to listen to us. Your feedback and ratings help other Surfcasters discover our podcast. Also check out our publication dedicated to surf fishing, Surfcasters Journal Magazine at surfcastersjournal.com. Tight lines and good fishing.